Takuma Sato. Welcome to Honda Racing TV. Episode 7, I'll show you about the world of IndyCar. We will also hear from McLaren Honda's Fernando Alonso. We will meet Honda's Enduro Junior World Champion and see how the talent of tomorrow got on in 2016. Very similar to Formula One, but just size is bigger, larger, a little heavier. We have a 2.6 liter V8 twin turbo. Uh, maximum level is uh, 12,000 RPM and uh, producing sort of 700 brake bre hops uh, plus. And depending on the oval or street course, uh, we're changing the uh, the boost control. The IndyCar actually changing the boost control, so I'll try to make it fast and furious for the uh, for the street road course but the, in oval uh, we have to reduce the boost and reduce the power because nowadays because the aerodynamics we go way too fast the maximum speed about street course is about 170 miles per hour and the uh, fastest road course could be reaching 188 ish so about 190 miles per hour so it's pretty fast but when you go to the oval particularly for the super speedway we're clocking at 230 miles per hour. We have uh, carbon brakes. Because it's a heavier car, you need a lot of mechanical grip. And then uh, this is a very advanced aero because this is a Honda 2016 package. This is uh, very latest and they're producing a lot of more downforce. Low drag, more downforce. In Indica, there's no power steering. So, um, <laughs> It's a quite tough. 5G is an F1, this was probably 4G-ish, so it's a little less. But in terms of the physicalness, it's as high as Formula 1 because we lose about 5 to 6 pounds of your body weight just for the race. Talking of being fit, here's a guy who just reached the top of his world. Introducing Honda Render Motor Racing's Enduro star Giacomo Redondi. weekend will be my weekend I hope so I don't feel uh, really stressed I just to do what I'm doing all the way, all the year till now and uh, we will see in the end of the day This uh, 2016 season for me was my best season uh, in my life till now. I win uh, all the races, all the day till now in the Italian Championship and uh, also in the World Championship. Hope to take the both titles and uh, try to improve myself for uh, the next few years. This weekend uh, is also my home GP. The people uh, like us, like uh, a lot uh, Enduro here in Italy, so I will be really proud to take the, the title here and uh, we will see.
I push myself 120%, not only 100, and uh, finally get the title. When I cross the line after last uh, extreme test today, I'm not really sure, but oh, everybody was joining me and it uh, <laughs> was really nice to get the title here in Italy. This title for me mean a lot of sacrifice and uh, was my goal, so nothing to say more. An impressive guy, congratulations. Now let's continue on four wheels with my old Formula One friend Fernando Alonso as he visits McLaren Technology Center. Okay, so yeah, this is the, the steering wheel of the 2016 uh, championship. As you can see, there are many functions and many buttons that um, we, we play around. Uh, the most important ones are uh, around this area because it's the, the normal, the ergonomic positions that uh, we arrive a little bit easier with the thumb. So yeah, we have, for example, the um, G-switch, which is uh, controlling the, the airs and the deployment from the from the engine, the power unit, when we use the battery on the straight to, to, the extra, to have the extra power. We have the diff positions to uh, rebalance the car, to have uh, less or, or more understeer in the car. This is for the mid-corner, this is for the entry. We have the overtake button, which gives us at least a little bit of extra power uh, in, in those moments. We have the radio on-off to talk with the engineers. Uh, and in this area we have the pit lane speed limiter to uh, set the car for 80 km an hour when we are in the pit lane. The launch map, which is uh, only for the starts on, uh, on Sunday morning, on off. We have here the brake balance uh, at the start of braking, at the end of braking, so there are uh, different parts of the braking area. And here we have the engine braking, so how much uh, the, the engine brakes on the corners, so it helps you turn. And then here there are a lot of multifunctions that um, are a little bit more complex because, for example, we can go to uh, interposition and then once you are in the interposition, the dash, we have the message and then we change plus or minus whatever position we see in this multifunction. When we are racing, obviously, we cannot uh, watch the buttons or the rotary switch and, and start thinking what it will do to the car. So we do a lot of simulator tests uh, where we can get used to at the beginning of every season. We do a lot of um, interactions with the steering wheel. Uh, first of all, we, we have the, the paddles for the, for the um, gear shift uh, at the back of the steering wheel. So uh, I think there are around 50 to 70 uh, shifts in a, in a lap. And we need to follow, we have here the dash and uh, there are some lights, some LEDs here that uh, start from blue and arriving to red. And uh, every time that arrive to red, you need to call for another gear, another gear. So this is around yeah, between 50 and 70 times a lap. And then on the other buttons, let's say that um, we can change corner to corner, maybe three or four buttons uh, in a lap. Uh, there are always some corners that uh, you have front locking. So maybe you adjust and you go a little bit rear with the brake balance for that corner. After you go uh, in that corner, you go back to the normal position. And this happened more or less two or three times a lap. So, they say that there are a lot, a lot of uh, interaction with the steering wheel in the race. Let's say that uh, from, from my debut in Formula One, the steering wheel uh, uh, changed uh, in a way that everything becomes a little bit easier and uh, there are much more information on the dash. Uh, the size of the steering wheel, the number of buttons on the steering wheel didn't change much. I think it's quite similar to, to the ones that I drove 15 years ago. 
but um, I remember to have only the LEDs for the gear shift and maybe a little number on which gear you're wearing. Now we have a lot more information and uh, uh, we are in control of many other aspects of the, of the car. Uh, the, the Formula One cars also are quite different now. There is a lot more technology. There are the hybrid system. We have the, this uh, uh, rotary switch here where we can um, control how much uh, energy uh, we deploy uh, from, the, from the electrical engine to the, to the car. So uh, we have a limitation of how much we can harvest, uh, which is two megajoules a lap from the brakes. So to do that, we have this rotary switch that uh, basically a higher position will stop this deployment on the straight a little bit earlier. So we don't spend that much of the battery. While in the qualifying lap that uh, we, don't, we have an uh, unlimited uh, uh, deployment, we go to the maximum, which is normally number one in our case, and we can deploy all the electrical engine until the braking point. So we have a lot more power for longer in the qualifying. There is always uh, some things to do, but um, even if it sounds difficult, when you are in the car, everything comes automatically. Recently, I, I drove the NSX, and uh, it's something that we have in, in that car as well. Uh, there are uh, three modes that you can change from race, uh, from sport, sport plus, and then track. You have uh, you can switch off all the controls, all the traction control, all the stability control, and uh, everything is in your hands. Sometimes on the steering wheel, sometimes in the in the cockpit area, and then uh, there is the hybrid system that you need to. Maybe you, you cannot change like in a Formula One car, but you can see on the dash how it's, it's recovering the battery, etc. So I think all the information here is, is all concentrated because we don't have enough space on the Formula One car, but it's something that also we see in the, in the Honda road cars. championship on and off road have been given the talent of tomorrow their chance to shine let's take a look at how they did it in 2016 The season was nearly perfect because we, I did uh, six podiums. I was very comfortable on the bike and yeah, my, my best um, moment on, on the season was in, in Donington because I, I won the race. I think uh, it's going to be a uh, pretty tough one for the kids. I think uh, they're going to have, uh, have some fun, uh, even if it's a tough round, but it uh, should be cool. It's a pretty, pretty good uh, opportunity, especially because it's on the MXGP uh, races. They ride the same tracks, they have a little bit of the same uh, idea of the program, and uh, they can learn, put themselves in, in a good picture. And, uh, try to catch some eyes from the teams, that's for sure. They have the chance to, to ride a 150, 150 uh, four-stroke and on the, on the MXGP race, so I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity for these kids. Is red, Mika Perez in pole, race is on, the Gutora had a very good start, Mika Perez is playing for the European title, so a lot has I think uh, 
after the Lausitzin race because I had 37 points, three races uh, to go. And yeah, yeah, I thought I could win, but until the last lap of the last race, uh, I can't say nothing. Mika is the 2016 champion. To 2016 European champion. Today we're in uh, Assen in the Netherlands for the last round of the Honda 150 Championship. At the moment our champion from last year, Emil Wekman, is leading. We are looking forward to again, just like last year, to a quite an exciting race for the last round. Emil, is, even if he's only 14 years old, is a quite smart kid. He had a very big lead coming into here. He lost some points this morning, but uh, I think he's gonna ride very smart and uh, hopefully for Emil, uh, bring it home tomorrow. That's it from episode 7. Uh, thank you for joining me and hope you enjoyed it. And stay tuned for more on the Racing TV.